All right, so here's a review video that's going to help you with your chapter one review packet. Uh, here's some tips for the first page. Okay, solving simple equations, you got to make sure to get rid of your parentheses. Uh, you can do that by distributing if needed, or sometimes you don't need to do anything, but you got to get rid of the, the parentheses before you combine like terms or go any further. The second tip is do not distribute a number unless it is touching the parentheses. Okay, what I mean by that is if you look at an example of, say, we'll say 2 minus um, 3 plus x, okay? Typically, students want to, that will make mistakes, will distribute the 2. You don't want to distribute the 2. Just distribute the negative. So you get 2 minus 3 minus x. And from there, you can just combine your like terms at that point. But do not distribute the 2. Once you distribute the negative, you're done with the parentheses. Uh, so it's a common error that I see students making. The second set of tips is involves absolute value equations, okay? Almost always there will be two solutions, okay? You gotta watch out, make sure if you see an absolute value equation that you know you're probably gonna get two solutions. The other thing you gotta watch out for are zero solutions, okay? Sometimes a function that involves an absolute value, or an equation that involves absolute value will have no solutions, okay? That's because if you understand absolute value, you know that the absolute value of something has to be positive. So if I see the absolute value of something equals negative five, like the absolute value of x, equals negative five, for instance, can't happen, okay? It just simply can't happen because the absolute value needs to be positive. So there's a couple things you need to look out for. So let's look at some questions on this review, okay? We're gonna start with question three. So if you're looking at the review, you wanna work along with me, here's question three. All right, so the first step you see, you got parentheses. You gotta get rid of the parentheses, okay? You do that by distributing. Okay, I'm gonna distribute the eight, and I'm gonna distribute the six, okay? Eight times three M, is 24m, 8 times negative 2 is negative 16, 6 times 1 is 6, and 6 times negative 4 is negative 24m. And you see that pretty quickly by distributing, you get rid of the parentheses and I'm ready to rock and roll. Okay, I'm going to get rid of the, the like terms because they're opposites of one another. I get 24m minus 24m, that goes away. Now I'm left with negative 16 plus 6, which very quickly gives me negative 10. So that would be very easy example of how you get rid of parentheses by distributing and then combine like terms. From there, um, skip four and five, I'm gonna go to the last bunch on the first page and I'm gonna look at number eight. Okay, number eight is a good illustration of what I was talking about as far as don't distribute too much. A lot of times students will see a question like number eight and they'll think they need to keep foiling and distributing and do way more than you have to, all right? The left side of the equation is set. Okay, I'm not going to touch the left side of the equation. I'm just going to keep rewriting it because I don't have to do anything to it. On the right side, I need to get rid of the parentheses, which actually is way easier than you might think. You got a 2 out front. I'm going to distribute that. And then you got a negative out front of the second parentheses. Okay, once you distribute that negative, like I said before, you're done. You don't have to keep distributing or keep foiling or anything like that. You're done. So I'm going to take 2 times x is 2x. 2 times 5 is 10. And then I'm going to get negative times 3 is negative 3. And then a negative times negative x is positive x. All right, at this point, I combine my like terms on the right side. 2x plus x is 3x. 10 minus 3 is 7. So at this point, I can see that something's going to happen here. It's going to be a little different than your typical equation. Okay, what that is, is the x's go away. Okay, so when you solve a simple equation, you're going to get one of three answers. Okay, number one, you're just going to get one solution. Okay, it's typical. You're going to get one answer. You could plug it back in, check your work, uh, but that's what's going to happen 75 to 90 percent of the time. You know, most of the time you're going to get one solution. Okay, sometimes you're going to get no solutions. Okay, and then the third time you're going to get infinite solutions. Okay. When do you know which one of the three you're going to get? Well, one solution is pretty simple. These two happen when the x's cancel, okay? You're going to get no solutions if this is a false statement. So if, for instance, you got 7 equals 10, that's not going to be true. It's going to be no solutions. But in fact, for our purposes, you got 7 equals 7. You know that's true. So the answer to this one is infinite solutions, okay? It's because this is in fact true. Okay, so that's a good uh, example of how to distribute, how not to get, get caught up, and it's also an example of when you get zero solutions or infinite solutions too, so it's a good question. All right, I'm gonna look at two more questions. The first one 
is number 10. Okay, number 10 is an absolute value equation. So number one, I know that I'm probably gonna get two solutions, but I gotta watch out for zero solutions. So I'm gonna tell you right now, because I know this problem, after the first step, you know it's probably gonna be zero solutions. So I get four times the absolute value of x minus nine over three. 16 minus 16 goes away, I get negative four. All right, at this point, I see absolute value is gonna give me some kind of negative. I could divide by four, but I can already kind of see what's happening here. All right, I get absolute value of x minus nine over three equals negative one, and you know that this simply can't happen. Okay, why can't it happen? Well, because the absolute value of something always needs to be positive, okay? So what you know when it can't happen is my answer is simply just no solution. Okay, because you can't have the absolute value of something equal a negative number. All right, last question from this page is question 11. Okay, question 11 is your typical absolute value equation. You're not gonna end up with a negative on the right side, so you'll probably get two solutions. So let's work, let's work through this and see what happens. So I'm gonna subtract five from both sides. So the first step always is to get the absolute value expression by itself, get the, get the things that are in the bars on one side, everything else, all the other numbers on the other side. So I get absolute value of two x minus seven equals one. Six minus five is one. At this point, this is where you gotta check and understand that you're probably gonna get two solutions. And this is kind of off this side. So as a side note, okay, what I mean by side note is to say, if I see like the absolute value of something equals five, so the absolute value of x equals five, then I know that x could be five, right? Because you plug five in, you see absolute value of five is five. X can also equal negative five, all right? And that's because the absolute value of negative five is five. So you see why there's gonna be two solutions. If you, if you look at it in a simple form, you kinda of see why there's gonna be two solutions. So for this particular example, the way you do this is you separate it, okay? You got two x minus seven equals one, or two x minus seven could equal negative one. And you're gonna solve both equations, and then you could check them to see that they work out. So two x, I'm gonna add seven to both sides, is gonna give me eight x is going to give me 4. In this case, I'm going to get 2x. I'm going to add 7 to both sides. Negative 1 plus 7 equals 6. I'm going to get x is 3. So here are my two solutions. And again, now you can check it. It's an equation. If you want to find out if you're, if you're right, simply just go up here, plug these two things in. So what, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to take 2 times 4 minus 7 plus 5. So absolute value of 2 times 4 plus 7, sorry, minus 7. this all right so checking this again so two times four minus seven let's try that again plus five okay so it's going to give me um, absolute value of that is going to give me absolute value of one plus five which is going to give me 6, or I could check over here the absolute value of 2 times 3 minus 7 plus 5. Well, that's going to give me the absolute value of negative 1 plus 5, which is going to give me 1 plus 5, which again is going to give me 6. So just, just checking it one more time, it checks out, and you can see that you're going to get uh, 4 and 3 for number 11. All right, here's page 2 of your chapter 1 review. Uh, and the big thing on this page is solving absolute value inequalities. And there's one tip I want to make sure and make sure you know, and that is that you gotta make sure there are two sides to the inequality. You have to make sure. Okay, and it's this absolute value. Absolute values are they act, they behave a little differently, okay? And um, basically what this stems from is like think about x being absolute value of x being greater than five. Okay? So for instance, like six works, seven works. Right, so the absolute value of six is six. That's greater than five. The absolute value of seven is seven. That's greater than five. But you gotta understand that, it's, that a lot of big negatives work. Okay, very small. I should say very small negatives, like negative six. The absolute value of negative six is six, and that's greater than five. The absolute value of negative seven is seven, and that's greater than five. So when you see this, the real easy way to think about it is to say, like, well, if a absolute value of x is greater than five, then x is greater than five, or you draw the other side, you just keep the sign going in the same direction. 
or x is less than negative 5. Okay, so let's just read that. This is like x is greater than 5, or x is less than negative 5. And that makes sense. If it's less than negative 5, like we said, negative 6, the absolute value of negative 6 is 6. 6 is greater than 5. Negative 7, the absolute value of negative 7 is 7, which is greater than 5. So you see that every absolute value of inequality has to have two sides. So let's look at a couple of these and uh, see how this works. So um, the first one I look at is 16. And here's the illustration. It says the absolute value of 11 minus 3x. It doesn't really matter what's in there. The absolute value of something is less than 2. So you're like, okay, well, if it's less than 2, it can't be like negative 100. You know what I mean? Because negative 100, absolute value is 100, and 100 is not less than 2. So you know that there's a, there's a boundary here. So what you got to do is you got to rewrite it and say 11 minus 3x, and you get rid of the bars, you get rid of the absolute value bars, but 11 minus 3x is less than 2, or it's greater than negative 2, okay? And now you get a two-sided inequality, and you solve it as we solve any two-sided inequality, which is I want to get x by itself. So I'm going to subtract 11. I don't just subtract it from one side, I subtract it from both sides, okay? It gives me negative 2 minus 11 is negative 13. This cancels, I get negative 3x in the middle, and then I get 2 minus 11 is negative 9. So at this point, divide by negative 3. All right, and now I divide by a negative. Here's your trick, right? When you divide by a negative, what do you have to do to this sign? Okay, again, divide by negative. Flip the sign, okay? Make sure... That if you're working with absolute value, I'm sorry, not absolute value, but if you're working with inequalities, that when you divide by negative, you flip the sign. So at any rate, you get x is greater than 3, but x is less than 13 thirds. So x is bigger than 3 or less than 13 thirds. And just real quick, let me see if it asks you to graph. No, it just says solve. So if, after I've done that, my answer is done. Okay? And if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. And if you were to, to graph it, you'd see that the, the values that you were working with. Okay, so looking at the other problems, um, 17 is a good example. And I'm just going to start 17 just so you can see. But the idea is the same. Okay, I'm going to get the absolute value expression by itself by adding 3. Get absolute value of 2x minus 4 is greater than or equal to 4. At this point, you get rid of the bars, the absolute value bars, and you say, okay, 2x minus 4 is greater than 4, or carry the sign over to the left where it's less than negative 4. I mean, and then from there, you should be able to take it home. So that's a, that's a good tip as far as absolute value inequalities are concerned. Okay, I wanted to look at one more problem, and that was problem 19. And this problem just asks you... Um, it gives you a situation, and it says, ask you to write an equation and then define a variable. Um, and also ask you the question is, how much money do you have left over to buy popcorn after the tickets are paid for? Okay, the hardest part about this problem is writing the equation. So I want to make sure that you guys have a little bit of practice doing this and just see how it works. So it says, a movie ticket costs $6.50. You have $35 to buy tickets and popcorn. How much do you have left to buy popcorn after the tickets are paid for? It says, write an equation and define a variable. So I'm going to actually just define a variable and say, like, the question is, how many tickets, right? How much money do you have left over after the tickets are paid for? Okay. So your variable, I'm going to call x. x is the number of tickets. So it tells you how many tickets you want to buy, which is four. But if I'm going to make, a, make an equation for the cost of going to the movies, it would be 650, basically x plus whatever you paid for popcorn. So the cost of going to the movies for this particular family is 650 times 4. Okay? So my, my equation is very simple. I mean, I don't even really bring the 35 into it. The question of what the 35 involves, you know, subtracting later. But 650 times 4 gives me 24 plus, so $26. So the cost of going to the movies is $26. So then you say, okay, how much is left over? Well, how much is left 
it's pretty simple. If you got twenty six dollars spent, you have thirty. You brought thirty five. Thirty five minus twenty six gives me nine dollars to buy popcorn. So nine dollars left. My equation would look like this, in which the, in which case x is the number of tickets. So yeah, it's kind of a, an interesting question. But if you could figure out that it's going to be nine, that's going to be pretty much um, you're going to be pretty good, pretty set. Okay.